Good day, folks. This is Hal Anthony coming to you from behind the woodshed, where we intend to open a can of whoop-ass on those misguiding government, mistreating our people, and to stop the subversion of freedom. Out here behind the woodshed, we are not bashful to lay on the wealths of truth that they will teach the lessons to stop government trespass against us, because sparing this rod will most certainly get us the shaft. Interrupting this current neo-coronial cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed. This cricketude busting episode is BTWRLM 376. As we keep plugging along, plugging away. All you quarantined up and no one at home. How can we all be quarantined at home and not be home? Where are we? Where are we as a people? I'm looking around all the social medias that I, not many that I go to, but a few that I do, and I don't know what people, why people are focused on every other thing than what they've been handed to to stop all this nonsense against them. See, I say that, and I just sit there and I think about that. Why do we do that? And it's getting worse, and it's getting worse, and it's being locked down, and people make excuses for letting the officials do what they will do, completely is a crime against you. And yet we'll speak about being free, or the promise of being free, or feeling that we're free, or that we're free despite what we see. And we're really not. And this has been the main problem. We could be, and I've provided over a decade now, lots of ways to approach what we're seeing. And even the things that I've pointed out that would allow you to avoid most of all of it, most people don't understand either. And I don't understand that because it's pretty well cut and dried. And I reference more the public, the the lands, uh, the public land that we learned through the mining law gave us exclusive possession and enjoyment, which relates over to patents, which gets you to your land that you have exclusive enjoyment of that the government's not supposed to interfere with. And, And yet they have, and they are. And and no one says a thing about it. No different than now. Now they have you in that land, that home that they that they uh, have you locked into. You don't realize it was a tax home. You didn't realize you were supposed to not let them do that to you. And now they have you locked there, and you're going to stay there. Oh, they'll let you out a little bit here and a little bit there, if you comply, or else you don't get. And so we have this dynamic being developed that we could stop but we won't and I don't understand that so I'm going to go through again today and I'll explain how this is locking down it make worse and worse and worse and we just keep watching it we'll do every other thing but besides focus on the points is what you always flabbergast me but that's who we are that's how ignorant we are as a society and that's a reality and maybe people don't. Maybe people will just accept that, shrug their shoulders, or, or just be insulted by that. But either response is not going to res, going to be responsive to what is happening to the world. Essentially, is and as it's been certainly written down. I mean, this is nothing as a surprise to me. And I don't know why more people, well, even if you see it, you just give lip service to that, that what you see, and don't really put it on the ground. Put it into something that's really something you have to deal with. And I'd been remiss to, and I don't know if I did or not now, but I've been remiss to respond to a comment that was at BitChute. And for those of you at, com- at BitChute, thank you very much. I don't know what happened a couple weeks ago. A lot of you flooded in and listened to the last time before broadcast. Thank you very much for doing that. I hope you spread. I don't see many thumbs up or, or whatever. I don't know if you're spreading the word around, but. The word needs to be spread around. We're not helpless. At any rate, there's a. Been, I got confused by the bit shoot commenting, and I thought there was like a ton of comments, but apparently it was one comment repeated over and over. I finally got to it and saw it. I wasn't quite sure I was going to deal with it until I saw that it was all the same comment. So I apologize for not getting to that. But uh, torn. 
Earth shaman uh, made a set of questions quite a few bit a bit ago, and I want to just touch base on some of it. Some of it I don't know what really to say more than to just move along. You have to assert the right. Find again, find the wrong you want to make right relative to what I'm going to read that he asks, and that's all very specific to where you're going to do that and whom you're going to respond to. And sometimes the way we get at something may not be the most direct route. And so that's another potential problem for people. And I know, I realize the, want to be straightforward and get right at something. But when you're in a war, sometimes the going directly at something may not be the best way to hit them. And you've known you me to come up with quite a, over the years, to come up with quite a few ways to get at what the objective is, even though, and then ignore the one they want you to, the, the bait, if you will. But let me read the questions here. There's a quite a, a couple statements and questions, so read for the question. I'll try to read it that way so it's not so confusing. But Torn Earth Shaman had asked weeks and weeks ago, maybe even a month ago, I don't even know now. Well, if what heck uh, is 5:31? If I looked at this date right here, so how he said he asks or she asks, how do I proceed with charging the government with treason and bring them to court? Or maybe that's the improper question. So I need to file a cease and desist order to the court where I live. Didn't the government take on the responsibility for people comprehending the law? when they made education compulsory? If they didn't teach us law, does that make the government liable for creating a fraudulent contract? Thank you for teaching us about law. I will go back and listen to your videos from the beginning. And that's one of the problems with the way I present. You do have to kind of, you have to hear me over some time. And part of that is done on purpose, not to draw some things out, but there's, again, we are an information control system, doing whatever I can to avoid any uh, interference. And so that's part of the process. I also can't tell people what to do directly because I think that's the answer. And in a way, it may be an answer, but it's only in the general. Everything is specifically applied. So you can't necessarily take a method I'm saying and and just apply it without really thinking about what you're going to do. But let me get back to the questions one-on-one -on -one and discuss, hopefully, just the, the concepting of it so you get an idea here. How do I proceed, he asks, how do I, or she, excuse me, I don't know who it is here. How do I proceed with charging the government with treason and bring them to court? Well, we have to, and I don't, this is not a judgment, just how we, what I see is we're thinking incorrectly. You have a problem, you believe the government you say the government is is causing the trees. Well, the government's just a form and establishment. And I know you're going to, maybe people roll their eyes back on this, but if you, I've found out if we keep throwing everything into a big pile, we do this, con, this conscience mashup of everything. We really can't get at the underlying point of what we're after. But charging the government, you really don't charge the government. You're going to charge someone within the government. Then you say, with what? Treason. Well, you've got to go find treason and find out what that is. That requires that the one who did that fulfilled the elements to be able to do that. But the problem with treason, any crime, and this should have been a clue to most people, that's a criminal charge. You People don't actually have the right to criminally charge anybody. You can make a complaint to your master, the attorneys, to do so. But you don't actually have a right to charge them directly unless... There's a statute that gives you that right. And that's, again, the, the government, the established, whoever the government is, the power, who everyone recognizes it's the power, whether whatever your thoughts are or my thoughts are on it, you have to go through that communication standard. So when we're alleging crime, when I allege crime, it's in furtherance of a harm to me, but it's through a civil side. In other words, the action that being harmed that I have civil remedy for is a, is actually a crime if the government had uh, the attorney had charged it out. Okay, so you got to be careful what we're saying. But so the government charging a government with treason, the government's just an inner, inner, inner it's a it's a fiction. 
It's an established. It's an establishment. It's in a piece of paper. That fiction's not to be disregarded because people rely on that establishment, and it's the people that are committing the acts. And yes, I guess corporations are people too. So we have that new nuance, and you're not going to get around it. So you might as well embrace that as well and hold your principle of what was supposed to be going on versus what they're allowing to go on. Realize we have the legal lawful problem. But you charge someone in their acts with a treason in order to show that what they did essentially is, in, as alleged, if you have the elements correct, is, is indefensible. Now, what we did in 2013 relative to treason, and because people think don't understand that word, and they will put you in a box pretty quickly to use it. I've showed, I've told you and explained to you, sometimes you have to look at these words and go to the long-form definition. In our 2013 lawsuit, we placed the onus of treason, the acts, um, the elements of acts of the people that we sued, which is the Bar Association, the political parties, the actors in the state, or the people in there, or the members of organizations, the political party members, the Bar Association members, were the active agents who were what we said in that, making war on laws of the United States. You were talking relative to a congressional grant of the minerals to all the people of the United States of America as obligations and duties under the enabling acts of the establishment. So the long-form statement for the treason that we charged out was that they were com they've committed they were committing war against the laws of the United States, all these entities, members, and these entities. So that's how we charged it out, but we weren't in the power of our, of saying that we could charge them with a crime. What we said was their acts constituted a crime, and that validates, well, that indicates that they were wrongful, and they also have to do knowing and willful, and that required a, a couple of notices as well. So there's a an established form of a presentation and record you make as you go along before you even get to the point where you can say treason. I know that's a short form comment in the bit shoot. We're just getting an idea out. How do I charge them the government with treason? Well, you're going to find someone in the government who's acted to make war on the United, laws of the United States. And that's the short form answer to that. You'd have to do some more research and bring all the elements that constituted that. And in a way that's not questionable. And I've, here's another example. As I, was, I wasn't going to quite talk this much, but this is the problem. You start getting and talking about this. These are very serious considerations that we were supposed to be making all along. And in a way, these aren't supposed to be questions. We were supposed to be an educated people. And that we ask these questions is not wrong, but it shows us that how far behind we are of things we should have and ought to know. When we charged when I, another law, private lawsuit with the, my, the claim co-owner, my mining claim co-owner and I, where we got locked out by a Forest Service employee, we I waited until they did something that had no question the act could not be considered to be other than knowing and willful and clearly cut. But the violation was done with intention. I didn't, I didn't, I had to wait and hold my time. I had to bide my time while I watched them violate us, until they did one thing that I knew that the laws were black and white on, that I knew the meaning could have no and more interpretation, that they were supported by principles in law that could not be changed, and that I could, that's the foundation that I was going to be able to move against a federal employee. And I was going to do it in a way to go after that federal employee in state court, which you're told you can't do. Well, you can't do it unless you can find this clearly black and white violation that no one can certify to. Violating your road law, your grants, is one of those things. And so when we're talking about these ideas and treason and you're going to allege that they're doing crimes, you have to bring the elements that are also interpreted without question. And so my example of the road was that. You you could, the, the federal employee can can be charged under state law in a state court you have to bring a very clear violation that no one would have known different this is where the qualified immunity starts to become what they rely on and this is what you have to start analyzing 
The road law and road grants are absolutely untouchable, and the jurisdiction is not even in the federal government once they're existing. So once someone tried to block us out, block our ingress and egress, that's two violations. Once on our ingress and egress, and one is over the general road app, road uh, ingress and egress at all. I now had a clear, willful, knowledgeable, intending har a violation of law that they did to harm us. And I can get that federal employee via, uh, to, into a suit in state court. And the process is that you've got to clearly state these things because the attorney general, for, the attorney for the United States, the United States attorney steps in and has to certify. And this is another thing you have to understand. They certify to whether or not that employee, it was within the scope of their job to do what they did. And there's a couple of other standards. So once you look at the terrain and analyze what you what what the weaknesses are, the narrow paths of of a, a of approach you have, you have to comply with all that. So when you just ask the question, how do I charge the government with treason? Well, for, why don't we find a guy or a gal who did the wrong, and then we bring the elements and we bring them in a way that the there can be no certification, no question that it was within the scope of their duty to do what they've done. And that's why I say if you go to the black and white, it's already printed. That's their first notice. You tie that in with their oath to hold to that. That was their acts. And now you then turn to the violation that they were underneath that condition that they were not supposed to do, clearly without question. And in the example I'm giving you with the roads, it's just clearly without question. No one's supposed to obstruct a highway. It's particular when it's not under the jurisdiction of the federal employee. So that wasn't under the scope of his job. This is the kind of thoughts that you have to go through uh, to start to bring to bear the power that's there to be done. And I'm sure a lot of people just rolled their eyes back because I'm not going to do all that. I'm too, getting too tired or old. I don't want to do it. It's just a waste of my time. Okay, then you're just given, you've just called yourself the slave. You just called yourself the citizen subject. And you say, you shrug your shoulders and say, I don't care. Okay, well, I don't know what more to say. I'm not talking to you. And you're maybe already not even tuned in. And for those of us that have a property have an established that we an establishment of government that we were working through that has been stolen, and we want to bring it back so that we live our peace in our lives. It may take a bit of a war uh, to do that. The fact that I have to go to war, and I don't mean fighting with guns. I mean the adversarial system in the courts is your new civil war battlefield. When I have to go there, I'm no longer living in peace. That's a self-evident proof. When I have someone that wasn't in the scope of their duty, even as a federal agent, I can, I should have remedy. When I can prove I don't have remedy even in the state court, now we've got a major problem that all the public, if you will, all the people in the country should have been aware, should be aware of, and work immediately to stop. And that's, in fact, what happened to us. I put my ducks in a row. I did the things I needed to do for our suit. I sued that federal agent. And then I was obstructed by the state court administrator. My case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they denied me complete remedy. Now, if I don't have remedy in the state who's obligated to, I've just proven on a record that, that there is no law. I've just proven that there is no established government. There is no republic. The very thing we sued the bar about, they proved it in what they did in that case as well. Now what do we do? Well, this is a, now a problem beyond me. It's beyond my, the co-owner or the claim. It's beyond any one. And why? We were supposed to be the educated mass of people that when we saw a wrong to any one of us, we rose up and we stopped that, it, this, that condition in the government. And we have various avenues to do that. One of the ways that we have, we saw in the Virginia Constitution, that's actually everywhere. What was cool about the Virginia Constitution is the fact that you it delineates a way to approach the problem instead of just leaving it. You have the right to abolish, alter, and abolish. That's a pretty it's, that's a pretty vast power. That it's so vast it's too abstract for people to even understand where you begin. And because it's so abstract, the occupiers in the government, the bar association in particular can bring up a bunch of opinions that you think is authority when it's authority it doesn't mean anything actually uh, to diminish that you have any rights whatsoever and you believe them you buy into that 
opinion and all it was was a suggestion of the enemy. Let me move on here as I start talking way a lot longer than I was thinking about, but this is where my mind starts to expand quickly on what's all involved. And, and if you all don't know that what I'm saying, then that's, again, how far behind, behind we are as a, as a society in stopping the encroachment. And everything I bring is trying to eliminate that vastness and bring us down to one thing we can do. I ask you to do that. You have to do it yourself. You have to be engaged. You have to make the decision to commit. I can't do that for you. I can't also stop you making excuses about why you can't. So the commit has to be there. You have to intend to prevail, and you're going to fight to engage the war, this this condition that we're in, because each one of us can't. Now, more and more of us start to be able to make that change. We saw that in Virginia that's already in the established, that's already expected by the occupier. We saw the Wisconsin. They're sitting there for you to ensure they're not doing any excess. I hear crickets everywhere. And we're just going to hear, see when I get to the tabs, we're going to see it's going on. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's just predictable as it was predicted. And let me go back here now. Or maybe that's the wrong improper question. Well, I don't know about improper question. Questions are questions. The question for me shows that we have a, a more more knowledge we need to give to remove that as a question. And that's fine. That's not that's never a problem. Uh, so I'm not so going on now. It's, so I need to file a cease and desist order to the court where I live. Well, it depends on what you want to do. If you think there's treason, you have a, have someone to do it. You have to give them the notice that they need to cease and desist. We actually did that in our 2013 lawsuit, JMD lawsuit. We filed a cease and desist. In fact, that was kind of a simple answer. I complete. I was so te- I got involved so deep in trying to make sure I, I had all the ducks in a row, if you will. We had we had everything ready to go. Um, the this if I call it, they call it the secretarial work. It was just it just lapsed from me. I got it was a suggestion. I'd just done another one somewhere else, and it just didn't seem to want to apply to our case for some reason. And I was talking to a colleague, and they said, well, "Why don't you do a cease and desist?" And it, as soon as I heard it, that's all. I just needed to be refocused from the more abstract writing type things for a court case and pulling everything together and all the evidence we needed and every act that had gone on. I had all this in my head, and so I was losing the ability to be able to be functional in the secretarial side. And it says, okay, why don't you do a cease and desist? Well, it was a cease and desist. Essentially, we already had the complaint written. So we had the parties, and we had what they were doing wrong and how, and all the elements. The cease and desist was to avoid that. And so you, you don't want your question about cease and desist. You've got a long way yet to go. Anybody does, not just a, a torn or shaman. You have a long way to go to prepare the wrong you want to make right. And, and a cease and desist could be, but typically it's against uh, the one that's going to be the the party to the respondent to whatever remedy. I say respondent because you don't. I don't know what remedy you would choose once you see what your once your harm is. Given there is a remedy. And notwithstanding the corruption that we see, because this is the point. I'm, a lot of people just think this is just opinion. You need to engage the system yourself to find out for you whether or not for you there's justice. We can't work off our opinions that they're not. We can say that, but that's not necessarily how this thing works. And that's why I'm trying to remove one of the major failures that happened in the, in the early, middle 90s and late 90s. A lot of assumptions were put out, a lot of belief this ought to be, and it's not. And so they would, everyone would act through what ought to be, and they were completely missing the point that it really wasn't. And there's an organized criminal syndicate they're up against. And and most people can't believe that. I mean, I look at co- the so-called COVID. Flu symptoms have locked down the world. I can't believe it. The common flu has locked down the world. It is our problem. So getting over here to the other question. So the cease and desist would come once you have your claim. Once you have your elements. Once you have identified, uh, in this case, let's just focus on the trees, that someone has breaching the law to the point that it makes war on the laws of the United States. I suppose that that phrase can be put into making war on the laws of the state in which you live. And we found that is why our we had really standing to sue was under sustainable development. That is making war on the laws of the United States. That's making war on the laws of the state that are savings, required savings clauses to protect things. It also then applied now because an agency, an executive agency was f- funding that war against people, we now now Im- implicate Congress. 
for not m maintaining the Republican form of government. And I say these things and people just roll their eyes with it and they, and they heard this before. Well, I'm saying we're making a record of what we know doesn't exist and moving it from opinion into record. And the problem is for us is once you do that, you have to have the rest of the people that see that and recognize now it's not an opinion. And we have work to do. We have someone to throw out. We have an occupier to oust. And the international law on that is if you don't, you suffer it. You will continue to live with it. And look where we've been going. Anyway, getting here, uh, now we move into a different type of question. Didn't the government take on the responsibility for people comprehending the law when they made education compulsory? Well, that's kind of a big kind of a subject matter. Just the short answer is no. They gave you, they purported to give you what you needed to go through life, which was what? The system they were going to put on you. If the people uh, had un understood their power then, just as, as lax, lax as we are today, or maybe worse since they had, the, uh, they had their own obligation, they would have said, well, no, this is a world of law. We keep peace by that. You're going to make sure that you teach us the law, not legal, but the law. Then, then we, the people, would have said, you're, what you offered us as a, as, a, as a gift was a Trojan horse to destroy us. But we're not that aware as a people. On the other hand, the government is just this entity. There's no obligation that goes on the government. And when people figure this one out, well, I don't know, they'll probably give up uh, because this is what this is. But there's nothing. This is what the sovereign, there's a do no wrong sovereign government here. So when you're talking about suing the government for treason, no, you can do no wrong. That's how they've set it up. And in a way, they can't, it can't do anything wrong because it's not a thing. But even in its function, it can do no wrong. It's a sovereign. No, they took it from you and they gave it to this thing that they now control. There's a whole other set of things right there that we have a lot of work to do. And I, again, now I'm going through lots of stuff that make people say, this is just obvious, just too big. And then, yeah, if you try to do it all by yourself, all of it, and this is why our numbers, or we have superiority in numbers, if we would just get back together and stop with the nonsense I see, whatever excuse we have that keeps us from doing all this stuff. But uh, didn't the government take on the responsibility for people comprehend? Only to the extent that they did for the system, which is not law, it's legal. The people should have stepped in and said, no, your legal is not law, and we need law. We need to be able to protect ourselves uh, against all this. That would have been a, probably a wise thing to do. But as far as putting it on the government, no, you're still obligated. And this is the other thing that people don't quite get, because I keep talking to you about. You have your own ob responsibility distinct from the government. In fact, it sits there, the people in it sit there to make... To, it, to listen for you asserting your responsibility to yourself. So there's nothing, and in fact, when you deal with the government, it's on you when you, I don't know if, I don't even know if people understand all this. I talk, like, I talk, my mind is just going like it's just stuff I know, and everybody knows this, but I'm realizing, as I just said, that more are things that people just don't know. When you deal with the government, it's strictly liability against you for agreeing with something the government agent says wrong, and you follow it. Did you, oh, did you hear me? Did you hear what I just said? When you rely on the government, and they're wrong, that's on you. And that made why um, it made it important to go look for the disclaimers. And they'll tell you they're not telling you what they're telling you. And yet everyone agrees with it. They all believe what they're being told is the truth. A disclaimer is if you go look at look at every web page, there's a disclaimer. Why would the why would there be if the government was trustworthy? Why would there be a disclaimer on any of it? It's self-evident that they can't be trusted, and so nothing you learn nothing you can trust by what a government agent tells you. Now figure that figure out how you're supposed to do it that do do your world organize your world now that way. It's complete strict liability to you. You have the responsibility. So no. Whatever the government trains you in, it's your responsibility to know the law, despite what they teach you. And it's your responsibility to understand how to get the law asserted. And then the point is, as we are more experienced, we have failures left and right. No one looks at that as at a mass of people. The mass of people don't look at those individual failures, look at what was wrong about the failure. In other words, it was just the imposition of the occupier and say, that's going to stop. No different in a way that I told you you're going to, even the policy considerations the cop used to kill you, you have to go in and make them, you have to de tell the government agent 
that they can't do certain things. It has to be written down. It's no different than a big contract. It's not the same social contract that was imposed upon you wrongly from the start of all this, from France no less, I think it was, but it doesn't matter. You agreed to it, and that's the obligations they put on you. So no, you can't uh, demand anything from the government. It's actually a benefit to you. What you didn't realize is like your civil rights, the benefit was the, the right to accept extortions of every kind and no other. Where do I get that? Do I make this stuff up, folks? What's the number? You should know it by now. I mean, all the listeners have been listening to me for a while. You should know it by now. Title 42, what section, folks? It should come right out of your mouth. Why? Because that should be prevalent in your mind of what you're up against every day wherever you go. Title 42, Section 1981. Not a year, it's a sectional code, and it says uh, you shall suffer extortions of every kind, exactions. You know, everyone's knocking down, uh, well, we were talking about the what on Freaker's Ball, the word master now can't be used because it, it connotes, it scares someone about the, might connote slavery, and uh, we can't use mastery or master. This word in this 1981 uh, section, it uses the word exaction. It doesn't mean anything but extortion. It's one of those few words in that uh, act that, that means what it says if you just knew that. They're not going to be able to tear down that statue because it means your slavery, and apparently no one cares about that one. Whether I don't care what side of the f political ideological I fence you might be. Because why? I don't know. Because you just sit there and take it. It says right there, if people would read it, the rights of the white citizen. The privileges of the white citizen, too. You're all involved. You're all colored by that law. Where do I see the people tearing that statute down? That statue down. No, nowhere. No, you accept it. You accept it. You've been accepting it. So when you have a, a system that taught you to agree to that, what obligation can, does it have to do any different? You've allowed it. You had every obligation put on you, and it is this way, strict liability, to not follow what they tell you wrong. And when it finally struck me, I'm going to put it back into mining law and dealing with a, f a federal agency, when it finally hit me exactly what I was seeing when I dug up all the disclaimers for the Forest Service, the BLM, and every other federal agency on their websites, started reading into them, started looking around, started doing a little bit more in-depth research, I realized there's nothing I can listen to in these people, and I better do something that's more grounded in the black and white, because that's what's protecting me. You and I have to know the black and white better than the legalists. And when I started doing that, we'd listen to nothing the government said. We produced all the notices that are required in law under our grant, and that's all we do. They don't recognize anything we do. They try to send back our mail. I just don't pick it up. It goes back. Fine. Done. I go on, wait till next year. Or twice a year we have notices. Right? You just certain, you just learn how to deal with them. We make a record that you know when you do your research, whatever it is, any subject matter, that you can defend that the law required that what they did was not, and then you point to their disclaimer. How could you agree with them? They're going to sell you down the river every chance they get, and if they're not intending to do so, they could by accident, and you're still liable. Why do we listen to these people? And why do we complain? Like, eh, okay, I'm going to get irritated really fast. Okay, let's move on. If they didn't teach us law, does that make the government liable for creating a fraudulent contract? What contract? It, it's a fictional thing. It's an implied agreement just by being around. And their system of occupiers said, if you, be, if you continue to be around, you're going to be subject to what we do. And you didn't rise up as a people and say, that's not good enough. We're going to have to put some bigger checks and balances that are black and white and understood to be that. So that you don't do what these nonsense these nonsensical things to us. And we have to do that with a clear mind as well. There are certain good things. There's certain good things that came out of even trying to hide the fact of your servitudes. So you got to look at it. It's real hard. Someone, I've told you this before. Someone asked me, why don't you write the mining law so it's better? I said, first of all, I didn't, I'm not the grantor. That Congress was that for the lands back to the people. I don't have, I'm not the author of that. Why would I be able, I have no authority to write that law. Secondly, what you're trying to respond to is how it's improperly imposed. How are you going to fix that other than to just uh, demand some accountability? Or find it, like I was telling you about the 
Forest Service uh, district ranger finally violating something that in law could never be done under that authority within the scope of that his job. And we attacked that. I went right, as soon as he did that, I was ready to go. Because I was waiting for it. I knew that, again, you can they're, they're a beast. They know they're going... They go to water every day. You know exactly where that's going to you put. You just wait for the trap. The trap just gets set, and you wait for them to go there. And they did. And so I, we. That's when we filed, and that's when I found out the house integrated the state court. The state is with the federal government. I got obstructed from entering, to the finality that the Supreme Court would not let me file. And then you say, well, so what's the point? Well, two things. One is I got proof that even though my complaint was right. They will not accept it to go after a federal agent. That's not a remedy. But what happened during the time? It took nine months to get an answer from the Supreme Court on a simple answer about the clerk violating the rule. The black and white rule was violated. It took nine months. And I said, well, if it's taken so long, they got a problem. We, I've nailed them again. They just got to figure out how to mealy mouth it. How'd they do that? They didn't even say a thing. They just denied it without a reason. Well, in the interim, about... About month four or five, the gate that was put across the road got removed. And this is what I told you a long time ago. This this is a war, but you try to work for the response that you need to continue to do what you're doing and take what you're given as long as it's adequate. And removing the gate was adequate. I didn't need to go sue them, even though we were harmed to some pretty extensive amount of money. It really wasn't about the money either. That just gets people's attention. In this lawsuit, I also sued the wife of the uh, district ranger because she was taking money that he, that she would know that he was doing wrong relative to connections and uh, evidence I had found relative to what the standard of a wife would be relative to the money that he was taking and the way her life was being run, she got put on her lawsuit as well. And so it couldn't work until I did the black. I got the black and white violation. When I did, all of a sudden the the whole justice system blocked me out, and yet the gate was removed. That was all we really needed. And so I didn't get justice. We didn't get justice. What we got is we got the gate removed by being vigilant against that encroachment, and that's really. In, the, the, in a way, the best we can get until the mass of people figure out how messed up this thing is. And we start to work methodically to start dismantling the infrastructure of our demise. That's now turned itself into COVID-19, the myth, the coronavirus bogus that's controlling the world. So getting back to the question of are the government liable? No, the government's not liable for anything. It's a sovereign. It can't be made liable unless it, it tells you it can be liable. It's all a fiction, so I, I don't want to argue with anybody on this. That's just what the, what you're walking into. A fraudulent contract, there was no contract in the beginning. Your acceptance of living in a place is that's contract enough. And so that's the point of when you start looking at your statuses and who's making a lie on those statuses, how we ch altered that a bit, and how do you take that lack of a con contract that the occupier is going to force you into the situation and be able to go through the black and white to show they don't have a right. They don't have a jurisdiction, an authority. They don't have a power. They don't have a delegation. In fact, if you're really good at it and you, you listen to what I'm saying, you go and you find all the obligations they had prior that they shouldn't and had no lawful, lawful right to impose. And now you've got them on both sides of the violation. And I'm saying, actually, until you have that, there's no cease and desist order that needs to go out, and you're not going to be charging them with treason. It's in your mind that there's a treason going on. You don't aren't you aren't really solid on how that's going on with facts and evidence. And on a side note, relative to another obstruction of traveling on on a highway on the Grant, we were a because of a violation of the state police. We sued the state police and the judge taking the case and the prosecutor. For a, as a, what they do in the, and you've heard this before, it's, but how do you get at it? We, this thing that we understand that the courts are really banks. Well, we, I was able to work out when you go look at what money laundering is, that what they do in court and how they did it against a grantee was a money laundering scheme. And so for all of you all that will say all that, 
and maybe even can kind of see it, why don't you settle down and now bring out the elements, and you too could be someone else that's starting to make the evidence beyond opinion that which, your courts are money laundering organized criminal syndicates. Don't just say it. Lay out the process that you already know, those of you that have done this, that lay it out as elements of violation. And until we start looking and communicating that way, these people that are taking us down will continue to take us down. There's no contract. There's a war going on. How are you going to fight that war? You're not going to do it with a gun. You're not going to do it with what you think the law is. And you're not going to do it even if you get the law right. As I've told you, I've just given you examples. And then you shrug your shoulders. Well, why? Again, we got the gate open. That's all I was actually interested in. I put a whole bu I padded the case, if you will. It was all valid. It was all legitimate. We were harmed and all that stuff. But what we were really after was getting the gate back open. And I'll just tell you, do you have the have they locked that gate ever since? This is years and years ago. Absolutely have not. In fact, all the pressure we had from the environmental groups going through the Forest Service, that backed down as well. They just stopped touching us. So what was that worth? Peace has been worth a lot. I didn't need the money. No, I don't need, that's not, the money just gets their attention. Who you sue gets their attention. Don't make your case too big, though. You want to make it so you can handle it. So, a fraudulent contract, no. Government libel, the people in it for found things. Substantial within the black and white, showing they had, without the scope, it was without the scope of whatever due to your office they had. That's why I keep telling you about this COVID and the lack of certification. They're all acting out of the law. Thank you for teaching us. Okay, that's enough. Uh, and and you're welcome, Torn or Shaman. Uh, that's, I'm just trying to point out what we're up against and how we're going to walk through the valley and shadow of death, if you will. We have to take that narrow path. It's there. It will, you just have to, for those of you that know you're being violated, you've got the mind to see it. Otherwise, because lots of people don't even see the harm. And this is the real scary part. This is where the most of society is. So last week, I was talking, we'll not get under the tabs. I would like to maybe move a little quicker here, get way behind on some of this discussion. I hope it's worthy of your time and, and that you get some information from it to actually work and use. I'm not talking just to get you to back off, oh, don't do that, or it's too to inform you it's too complicated, or to get you too excited and motivated to go do it the wrong way. This is a methodical, this is just, I can't, I can't say it any different. This is like you're literally... Like you're in a war, you're fighting someone, and and you have to make sure that every step you take is going, not every and every move you make actually is well, it's going to be watched, isn't it? So you got to make sure that you're doing everything within the recognized constraints, and if you don't, you're going to become a bad example in history, as we see replete. That I don't want. To get into anymore uh, we got to stop all that so last week i was telling you the cops I, they could be gone I, I'm, I'm done with it with these guys uh, they don't do anything i've had more stuff stolen from the gov by the government into my life has been interfered with more by the government and the police than any any gang or group of of, a, of criminals a group of thieves hasn't stolen more than what the government has from me through my life and they've all been through law enforcement and so, good riddance with these guys, what I said last week. and But here we have, as cops, in it to show you that we can be free of this if we just just demanded it as the people. And how we do that, again, uh, alt we can alter and abolish as as the people see fit. My my caveat is that you make a record that you have the expend, you've ex exhausted, as they say, exhausted every other remedy and shown that there's still going to be the harm. And there's no established way to do it. In other words, you have no remedy at law or even legal. And so we have here now we see as cops in Atlanta refuse to do their jobs, crime plummets anyway, chaos does not ensue. And this is um, an odd way, this story is an odd way to get at the fact that because of the George Floyd thing and the, and the liabilities the cops are now feeling, they're quitting. And to me, good, good riddance. But they're, they're not because they're quitting was the crime plummeting in this one instance they talk about that was important. To, I wanted you to see that 
when the cops became liable or they started to get an attitude about maybe their liability, they stopped enforcing all the frivolous laws that they used for revenue. And this would be traffic laws in particular and other things. They stopped being the criminals they are. And in large part, they were fomenting the crime records. And I've, I've talked about all this before, but here's another person that sees it. And they're utilizing this George Floyd thing to start showing that when you look at the, the chronology, the week before, a week after, and this and that, when the cops stop becoming criminals, crime drops. You're not extorted against or coerced at all. And when that happens, because there's no perception when the crops are not there, all of a sudden the society doesn't break out into chaos either. Pro in a way, proving that the cops are the criminals causing the crime and the disquiet and breaching the peace by their existence. So anyway, good, it was an interesting article to come after. I was talking about it last week. Not a new sentiment. I'm just saying here's proof. If you needed some proof to go move forward to start getting the idea that we don't need the government the way it's established, we could likely get rid of most of it anyway. And I say most of it because those, <clears throat> excuse me, I say most of it because there's an establishment that there's still a truth that people are not cool. We're not cool amongst ourselves. And so there, there is this mitigating problem. And when you, we see in history, when we don't have a formal forum to go to, to work our differences out, we just start killing each other. And we can see that pretty clearly in the different, in the distinction when like in South Africa, they just gave carte blanche lack of remedy to a group of people to go attack another group of people. And you see the genocide going on around that. That's what we re return to. For those of us that would like to live in peace and quiet and goodwill toward men, not everybody thinks so. You know, the only example I can give you for this is Cain and Abel. We were told. We were, this is, there's a the dynamic in the world that, that that's going to be forever until, well, until it's not. I mean, it's not going to be us that does it. So crime plummets when the cops go away and the chaos doesn't ensue. I told you last week there's historic reference to, to uh, cities and towns, counties, got rid of their government, they were fine. Got rid of the bar association to find the miners used to get rid of the lawyers all the time. They were fine. They did their own thing. And again, the Jefferson Mining District was established to try and get that miners to do that. The microcosm of the miners, the macrocosm we call America, the miners, and for the most part, fled once the idea that they had to actually do something to keep themselves protected they ran away. The core group of people still remain. But the most of people ran away. They want someone else to do it. They were willing and they have and they've done. They handed over to the Bar Association what miners used to throw out on a rail, literally tar and ferry, get it out, get move the attorneys out. No mining, no mining camps tolerated lawyers, attorneys actually. And they did their own law. So we don't, we have the examples if everybody that I'm, listens to me say I'm, I'm, list, I'm for established government, not the way it's running, but miners were made their own government. So I, I'm not against government that way. It was by and for the, the miner, the, the law of the miner. Now, if we just expand that microcosm to the macrocosm of society we have today, we can likely do the same thing, but we're, we're, we won't. Now, I'm not saying that permanently, but we won't. And we won't right now. We can see that. In particular, all y'all that are quarantined, but no one's home. Here, not a peep. And so let's move on quickly here, moving on through this uh, nonsense of the injustice, I guess, uh, that we see. A pretty remarkable dis uh, condition happened last week. And I wasn't into the D, I wasn't into the situation. I'm not into a lot of this, uh, stuff. I, I see it. I recognize there's real serious problems, but I also know it's partly theater. But it's interesting to watch how this theater plays out where General Flynn obtained a dismissal order for the conviction that he at once, at one time agreed to. The important part about this case, the read the Zero Hedge article, Flynn dismissal order thoroughly demolishes dissenting judges' opinion. You need to read this decision, and I got a link for that. I won't go through it. I'm going to read this report here. It, it's a, someone who interprets this. 
it does a well enough job that I just want to get the flavor of what was going on. This is part of the deal that's happening uh, in this country. Uh, that uh, general, and I understand the general, this general, if he wasn't the target of this overthrow, of Trump in particular, uh, is a, apparently a good general if, if a war a war uh, general is something good. And at one regard, we do have to have people that that are out to protect a country because, the other, again, Cain and Abel, there's another country that likely wants to take what you got. Uh, this is that law of war. This is that perpetual thing that goes on. We haven't figured that out as people. So we have a ton of work to do in that regard. But here we have, I found interest in this dismissal. Again, how they did it. And how it relates to, in some regard, the things I've told you th that you can do. And how this turned out was Flynn's uh, attorneys filed a mandamus in an appellate court to tell a judge who was had made a decision to interfere or look at interfering with the government's, the federal government's so, so-called sovereign authority to s stop stop a prosecution where it looked like it was a it, they didn't have the evidence. The mandamus was used by the victim of the uh, initial attack to to enforce the attacker, the United States government's a, attacker's position that they had the right to dismiss the case because the judge, who was also part of the government, but supposedly in the judicial branch, was going to extend the prosecution. And this mandamus asked of the, of the appellate court, the District of Columbia no less, and they do mention Article 3, which caused me to pause. Where is that the court? At any rate, it said, uh, talked about that the government, when it wanted to kill the case, dismiss the case, the judge didn't have the right to continue it. The victim of the government's attack protected the government, which fascinating to me is partly what's going on here. What I also want more, I mean, more to read than to, you can read, but I'll read a little bit, but is the fact that when you see this going on, if you think this is a straightforward type of establishment in government, boy, this case will tell you certainly that it's not. It'll also inform you how far we are from real justice and that it imposes upon us the higher responsibility if we intend it for ourselves. That this guy Flynn, and right now it's he's innocent. He's supposed to be presumed innocent, notwithstanding his guilty plea, which was coerced again. All this injustice in the system, and that's what I want to see. Not that's what I want you to see with this whole thing. The victim of the comes to you, the attacker's aid to remove what apparently the so-called sovereign was having trouble with its own officer to stop beating on the victim. And the victim said, hey, you got to give that guy the right to stop beating on me. In other words, the guy was innocent all this time. He was literally coerced, criminally coerced of a, of a, a, a plea to guilt, which he removed later with new, supposedly new evidence. This whole thing is looking at an absolute injustice in my mind, is how I took it. How they get there is fascinating. What it can tell you, if you have an insight, is also fascinating. And I think we can take some of these rules, these tools, these these outcomes. The, dis, the dissension between the justices to show we're in some real trouble in this country. That the, just, the district courts that you're supposed to, you're told, are supposed to be the law, can be this wrong, is another one of the problems. And just complaining about it's not going to solve it. The Bar Association is critical in, in a, how they've done this. You're not going to get it even by when you hear me say we complain about the Bar Association. No, it's not going to happen because you complain that your oppressor is beating on you. That's, that's still not, that still makes you the citizen's subject slave that the promotion out in the riotous world wants to make you believe that because they pull down a statue that they can actually stop the statute that actually is putting the slavery on everyone. So 
Flynn had to go through a lot of gyrations to get himself pulled out, of, and he was innocent, apparently. And the fabrication within the DOJ to start with, I hope you don't miss any of that. As I, again, I'll read a little bit here about this case that Flynn wrote a collateral attack against a judge that would not dismiss the case when the United States government said we want to not prosecute no more. And I want you to really think about that dynamic. But Missouri appellate attorney John Reeves has weighed in on today's decision by the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Very serious interpretation here going on. Remember my talk about where is the Article Three courts? And we find that one is in, there's only one. The Article Three court is only one, in, there's two, one of which is by statute that everyone gives lip service, in particular these attorneys uh, in lawyers' robes, uh, in judges' robes, they, is in Washington, D.C. Which one may be up for opinion? I do know that the website for the claims court says that one's an Article Three court. I do know that the appellate court for the Federal Circuit claims to be an Article Three, But I don't know that these courts have ever claimed to be Article Three. They give lip service to it. And again, D.C. is a district, which I understand now they're going to try and make a state. That's going to be very interesting. How is a state coming in on equal footing have the power the United States government has in the district? Which was, again, the convolution now of the original establishment and the check and balances that were supposed to go on that we have never enjoyed. And one of my goals has been to educate people as best I can to start getting more and more and more and millions and millions to start pressing back to regain what we were needing to see instead of what they've handed us and we keep accepting. But uh, John Reeves uh, is an attorney who interprets this decision. The, the appeals court for D, the District of Columbia ordering Judge Emmett Sullivan to grant a DOJ request to drop the case against Flynn. Okay, so think about that. Maybe people don't want to, but you have to consider what just happened. The victim of an abusive prosecution had to make a motion to an appellate court that said that, well, my, my abuser wants to drop the abuse, and this judge over here doesn't want the abuse to stop. Can you order, with this mandamus, order that judge to stop? And, uh, the the United States Pro DOJ didn't apparently have the sovereign power to stop it, is really the nonsensical thing here. But anyway, this is interesting how it plays out. The opinion authored by one of the three judges of the panel, Naomi J. Rayo, quote, thoroughly demolishes, close quote, a dissenting opinion judge uh, by Judge Robert Wilkins. You really need to read the, the lameness of this dissent and how deftly she really does destroy it. And you need to watch the dynamic on what the standards are. That's really most important. I'd like you to have to read in these court cases. In fact, this decision is not that long. It shouldn't take too long to look through and maybe a little longer to really work through what was going on here, what the infighting of the judiciary is. And don't ever forget that that district court judge was supposed to do justice, and that's supposed to be the law. And it, he failed utterly here and brought an innocent man into condemnation and a long-term, years-long fight. I can't imagine how expensive. I don't know if this, how this guy, how you and I would have got the defense that he got in the, the high place he came from, supposed, you know, the stinking abyss being the low place, how he was able to fight all this. But if you watch and see how this was working, it's going to give you some tools that you can use as you see how, well, you really see the failure that we can use inside that system if you're willing to step up. And it's not just in courts. This is how you would, you get to a mindset on how to address these little bureau rats that you're dealing with that are clothed in, in delegated authority. In particular, I'm thinking here with the public health authorities and the COVID that has all these, all you quarantined, but no one's home. The lights are on, no one's home, folks. And that is everyone that's listening to me that hasn't defended themselves against the right and the assertion against a fraudulent, non-certified cause for symptoms that has taken down your way of life, your expectation of anything, freedom, and 
making the next step to impose the next technocratic control grid that the military and the uh, international occupiers in this country with their infrastructure through the same systems I'm told, the sustainable unity religion has for you. And that that religious, international religious freedom, thank you for the links and thank you for the acknowledgement. What I was telling you was coming has been signed, but, and I also want to just point out that was for the fe, for the foreigners, but they're going to allow that harm in, in the gates. And so I don't think people notice all this, but I'll mention it anyway. Thank you for acknowledging that I pointed this out years and years ago, that it's happened now, and Trump was the affected one. This is the kind of thing I'm showing you. You look at the where it stops making sense, what applies where and what it doesn't. In this case, this is the D.C. circuit. You're looking at a mandamus of the of the slave being beaten down by someone who has to petition a, a third party to say, hey, that guy want, now wants to stop beating me, but this your judge over here won't let him. It's the most nonsensical condition I've ever seen, but this is supposed to pass as justice today, and they'll tell you this is the best they can do. Oh, what else? He got his remedy now because we had a court stop it. It's not a remedy. It means you're under an exaction of every kind and to no other. But uh, this goes on in discussion and author an opinion that opinion Reeves thinks uh, this dissenting opinion was so far off base that he shot him shot himself in the foot when it comes to any chance at the end bank review which is where they're going to they may review to have the entire circuit review this decision to of the mandamus remember i talked about in oregon they used the, the state used the mandamus to collaterally attack a judge's a circuit court judge's decision instead of doing an appeal this is the same type of action here i'm talking to you about your writs your writs have a collateral attack power i've been talking to you about them for a long long time it's how you can run an injunction through it's a writ is your habeas corpus these are collateral attacks to actions that have, if you will, the, I don't like using the term, but I'll use it, the common law power. They come from the establishment or adoptions of the establishment that had certain remedies against broad acts that were not in law, and they require an, an, act, an action from a, a, a so-called court that's also a fiction that doesn't act in law to assert and protect your properties that are in law. And so, when you start getting this understood, I mean, everyone just want to give up, but this is how they've gotten the problem. And until we come together with knowledge and say all that nonsense is what it is, nonsense, and we're going to stop it, this is not is a, not allowing for peace in our society. However, it's framed as being the best we can do. The people now are going to decide for themselves, reserved to them in every constitution. We as a people are going to say that ends now. We're going to try a new plan to bring better peace, the more perfect peace, if we can use and co-op some of the criminal Lincoln's decision to, to take all this away from you, and you kind of allowed it, and then here's the point. You allowed it after fighting. That's a conquest to some extent, and the proclamations tell you that, and then people think they can use their Second Amendment. It's likely, like I said, likely not going to happen. I don't care how many millions you got out there. You're not organized. You'll be dismantled pretty quickly. As, as I've seen very clearly, you take quite a few hundred people, reduce it down to a handful really quickly when the when the going gets tough, and you become ineffective at that point. And the occupiers are using that weakness in this system against you, and you all maintain that that disadvantage by being crickets. Okay, I'm interrupting this pretty bad. Uh, let me go back to read a little bit of this. Reeves has written uh, filings for the US, United States Supreme Court cases on Pax Rayo's outstanding opinion in the below Twitter thread, uh, conveniently adding, added which, added which page you find this uh, he's referring to, thread, Flynn Mandamus Opinion 1, Judge Rayo's opinion joined by Judge Henderson granting Flynn a mandamus is outstanding, not only of our legal reasoning, but also of how it completely eviscerates Judge Wilkins' dissenting opinion. You have to read that opinion. you got to read the first part to see how she does it so you get a preference, preface. When you read how a judge can interject inconsequential things to try and make a point. This is that idea that you can be 
this is not not the idea that you can be 100% right but not not applicable. This is where you're just bringing up stuff. And if you don't understand what the standard is, this is how they turn a case. Had this other judge not been in that place, and I don't know what the political dynamics is in that court, because this is normally a, a an all or, or nothing type court into the more uh, progressive, if you will, liberal, no, I can't say liberal, but progressive ideas. This one came kind of out of the blue. There is something going on in those courts at this point. That's not good really for justice, and even though that turned out to be okay. This says that internally we cannot rely on a district court judge's the authority he's given him to declare the law as a presumption, until as a fact, until overturned, because now you're suffering the so-called due pro, the only due process they allow, which is a lot of times ultimately not as a matter of right. You don't have a matter of right to get to the court of ultimate decision, and what is it? It's nothing more than a bunch of bar members who have established a system against you. And there's no real check and balance. They're just administrators. They're just they're not hired. I mean. Uh, in, in the Supreme Court, are any of them voted in? No, they're no different than a bureaucrat. And, and so, I mean, you got to really, you know, I say this stuff, you got to think about it. It's not to say dismiss it and not to say, oh, that's what it is and then disregard it. It's to understand what we're up against and why you hear me say what we've done. I said, I disregard the, the BLM anymore. We just send the notices the law requires us to send. I've said it, they tried to send them back. I wouldn't, I set up a way that they, I told you, if you get the right location in your mailing location, you can do this because the rules are set up this way. You just take advantage of the rules the way they are. And those notices they try to send back to us so they don't have to claim they have a, they've ever have it or received it or filed it, it's now sitting in their mail. No, okay, so I don't have anything more to do. I just use the operation of the codes the way they are. you got to be clever if it's clever, clever enough to understand the condition you're in and start utilizing that to your benefit. Being quiet is not going to do it. But, okay, I've really interrupted this, this thing. I guess, you know, part of me doesn't really want to read, and I guess that's what I'm doing to myself here. It's not reading. I'm talking. The, the, the principles underlying this case are really immense. They were probably the biggest news I saw was this case, the, the, this dismissal. Not because I it was interested in the General Flynn thing or the Trump thing or any of that or the Russia Gate whatever, not interested in that at all. It's the dynamic that's going on. Evidence to you that you don't there is no justice. You have to understand it can't be justice when the victim of the beating beating had to go to a third party to, to tell to to get them to order a fourth party to agree to have the abuser stop abusing you. On the other hand, there was a remedy for that, however that worked out. When I say you have to be fluid on the battlefield, this is that case. I'm not agreeing with it. I'm saying this is what it takes. And until we as a people rise up to this fluidity and responsiveness, we're really not going to make it. I don't see how we can make it. Let me move on and read a little bit more. In addition, Judge Wilkins' dissent opinion is so off the mark that I believe he shot him. Okay, i got to read. This is the other problem with this story. He wants to repeat. Judge Arreo comes out swinging by holding that it, its earlier opinion in Fokker, F-O-K-K-E-R, quote, forecloses the district court's proposed scrutiny of the government's motion to dismiss the Flynn's prosecution. The government had filed a motion to dismiss. Flynn had to file a mandamus to get it enforced. Fascinating. In, re, uh, in, in relying on Fokker, Judge Rayo explicitly rejects Judge Wilkins' argument that Fokker's holding is dicta that is non-binding. She holds Fokker is directly controlling here at page 14. Keep in mind that Fokker was written by Chief Judge Srinivasan, Srinivasan an Obama appointee, Judge Srinivasan, uh, does not want Fokker's legitimacy undermined, no matter his politics. Judge Wilkins' dissent implies that Fokker was wrongly decided and that it conflicts with the other federal appellate courts. Judge Serenivazan uh, will not be impressed by this argument in deciding whether to grant an end back rehearing. Fokker does not create a split. Now, 
let me just as it I just read that it reminded me to, I forgot to tell you listen to the politics in so called the law listen to a real dynamic in here now some of this you can use to your advantage if you research deeply enough to hear it to find this before you go in I want you I'm just trying to point out it's it's one thing to say that there's a corruption it's quite the other thing to be a people that demand justice this kind of a thing identifies uh, major problems within the system even though the whole system is a problem and may give you abilities to start identifying the failures in order to do what invoke your the right of the posterity essentially notwithstanding what they say see this is the thing well, I want to point out the fact of that Virginia it didn't matter what the establishment said once the people had the probable cause and the record to move for maladministration. Judge Rayo goes on to emphasize that while the judiciary inqu judicial inquiry may be justified in some circumstances, Flynn's situation, quote, is plainly not the rare case where further judicial inquiry is warranted. This is where the government says we're going to stop. We want to we want a motion to dismiss this case because we don't think the case warrants prosecution. We don't have the evidence. And the judge said, well, hold on. Hold on. We're going to give a private citizen the right to look at that problem and maybe hold this defendant for the continuing case. Rayo notes that Flynn agrees the government's dismissal of motion, so there's no risk of his rights being violated. In addition, the government has stated insufficient evidence exists to convict. Rayo also holds that, quote, a hearing cannot be used as an occasion to superintend the prosecution's charging decisions, close quote. But by appointing amicus and attempting to hold a hearing on these matters, the district court is inflicting irreparable harm on the government because it is subjecting its prosecution prosecutorial decisions to outside inquiry. Now think about that. This is what I say. Flynn says, the guy who's beating me wants to stop beating me down. And one of the guy's agents in a different branch, another office says no. And so Qu Flynn comes out and says, but you're violating the my abuser's rights to not let him stop. How screwed up is this whole thing? And this was supposed to be law from the judge before? Not happening here, folks. The district court has, this, this judge writes, has acted by appointing one of the pri one private citizen to argue that another citizen should be deprived of his liberty regardless of whether the executive branch is willing to pursue the charges. This justified mandamus being issued now. And why you say that? Because you go look at the standard for mandamus, which they explain in this case. So if you want to know what a mandamus is supposed to do and the elements you have to have, this case will explain the, the rudiments, the framework for it. Now, Judge Rayo also makes a short work of Judge Wilkins argument that the court may not consider the harm to the government in deciding whether to grant mandamus because the government never filed a petition for mandamus. The government's already filed a motion. It's been been answered by having a private citizen go to try and beat on the private other private citizen even more. And the government didn't file a mandamus because its motion was already acted upon. What I find interesting is the government did not file a mandamus. And they waited and they waited and waited until Flynn's attorneys decided they were. Judge Rayo notes our court has squarely rejected this argument and follows with a plethora of supporting citations in the in the opinion if you go read it. Judge Rayo also notes, contrary to what many legal commentators have misled the public to believe, that it is, quote, black letter law, close quote, that the government can seek dismissal even after a guilty plea is made. You've been misled, folks, on, those, on that point, haven't you? She says it right there. Like I said, this is a very interesting, this is the biggest news I got, had last week, this decision. Not because of who was involved or what they did, because what's going on, the dynamic in this case that you're subjected to 
100% of the time without remedy to it, that once you know what's happening, you get to look and peer behind the curtain and go after these guys to stop them while you write your paper in anticipation of this kind of thing going on. This is what I tell you about learning the battlefield. There are, you'll learn if you write, you'll learn by court decisions to read enough of them. You can build into your case. You don't go talking wild stuff everywhere. You build into your case the anticipatory defense against a response and more importantly, a lack of response. And you do it, I've done, you learn how to do it in very short sentences. What's interesting is nobody understands what you're doing, which I find perfect, but that's an interesting thing because these are the legal minds can't understand what law does. And that, in a way, that's perfect too because you have them, you have them in the, con in the condition where if they can't understand what you're doing and you know what you're doing, then you can explain what they didn't know. You show ignorance and you show a failure to be able to understand and a, a dereliction of their duty to understand. Because where you don't have an attorney, they're supposed to give great latitude to what you say as long as you, it has some merit, you, they can find a merit. You're not supposed to talk so obscure, but when you're building in an anticipatory defense to a potential breach or to a potential failure of action, because you realize that's the beast going to act, and then they didn't see that, and you call it out later, that's perfect. Now, I've just went through a bunch of, talk about dimensional, you know, five-dimensional moves. That's what we're dealing with. That's what they've set up, and that can be defeated. If you read these kinds of cases that explain the problems, you've been misled. Did you know that? Well, I did. I, I've known it on other, th lots of other things. And you also realize when you walk into that, whether or not, well, who you're talking to may be somebody that you can't talk to. You also will not, you won't be sucked into wasting a lot of time with them. That's another style of cease and desist order. I guess, again, this, this case, you read through, you look at the dynamic. If you really start to apply yourself, well, you if you don't apply yourself, you, you think I'm nuts here. You, you won't even understand what I'm talking about. When you do, you eventually in the future, you, you do apply yourself. You'll start to see what this is speaking to you, where you start to identify that's what you're up against. And what I'm saying here would then help to move you along to move move the pro answer the problem that you have how to move around it as judge wilkins argue, argue judge wilkinson's argument that a district court may conduct greater scrutiny whereas here the government reverses its position in prosecuting a case judge rayo points out that the government necessarily reverses its position whenever it moves to dismiss charges and so this is that was a big statement right there that Totally missing in this other judge's dissent was the awareness. But that's exactly, the, it's self-evident that the government does that. You don't have standing at all to argue against it. It's not a point of contention. It can't be. It is what goes on. And this is the mentality of the people that you're bringing a case to. And so what I'm suggesting to you when you do the habeas is and go down through the statutes, even if you put those in footnote that they failed and breached to do, this is the things you're eliminating. You don't allow them even a bit of opinion to interject a thought that's not, it's, it's self-evident, but they're looking past. And this happens a, a lot, just a ton, a ton. In fact, in a recent discussion with an attorney and on behalf of another miner explaining to the attorney the mining law, the really the way it works, but looking at it through the administrative failures, the, the, the statutes actually say what's supposed to do, but the agencies fail to do that, and all the courts use that precedent to follow back through like bad studies. In explaining that, the attorney completely understood how the, ball, the, the cart gets off the horse, how looking through and, not, and giving essentially lip service to self-evidency is injustice on its face, and this judge is sitting at the appellate level. And I can tell you there's a lot of appellate judges with this blindness. You know, that, that woman that they show us that has the blindness, the, the, the blinds on her, I think it's slipped down over her mouth for COVID, and they're looking, and they look exactly at what they need to do in order to make stupid statements like this to try and make themselves relevant to a point that doesn't even exist. 
But if you're not aware enough of the battlefield, you don't see it. That's where they take you out. And I, and I can just say that minors are taken out all the time by their legal attorneys that claim to have an expertise in mining law, claim to have an expertise in property law, claim to have an expertise in, in uh, trust law, but don't apply the trusts. The obligations and duties on those things that we see as established government offices that give lip service to that. We're so, again, as a society, we are so absent. It's, it's scary, really scary. And yet it's right there for us to see. You hear me talk about it in the abstract a bit on these basic ideas without anything to focus on. Subject matter statements I make, like patents or property law or trust uh, enabling acts, all this other stuff. Constitutional sections, I pointed out, it's specific enough there, but it's only general in its application until we apply specificity of cause, harm. And so I have to be cautious on, you know, I always speak a little bit light in the fact that it's not absolute. Well, it's never absolute, so that's an easy one. But, I mean, you don't hear an absolute. And if you don't listen for one, forget it. That's not the way this works. The absolutes will be on how, the, how you hear this working. All the problems that are inside the system that they want to sell you is the best we got. Given the absence of any legitimate basis to question the presumptions of regularity, there is no justification to appoint a private citizen to oppose the government's motion to dismiss Lynn's prosecution. What I don't understand why she didn't say right there is the citizen has no standing to argue against the government. Eh, maybe for a different day. But Judge Rayo saves her most stinging and brutal takedown of Judge Wilkinson's dissent for the end. And I, again, I want to caution you, don't read this for how this judge takes down another judge. Read the dynamic that's built into this. Just a, it was, to me, it was shocking. Not shocking because I know it, but I mean, it's shocking to watch them in the fight amongst themselves. Little secrets pop out. She, this Judge Rayo tells us, you've been misled on that prior point. You've been misled that the, the the government doesn't have this kind of a power. No, where that misled came from, I don't know, because I learned they had that power a long time ago. But it, it, not, not here, not, neither here nor there, if you didn't know. And, I, and not, to dis, not to insult anybody, you don't know a lot. We And then we as a people don't know a lot. And I keep telling you, you're being misled, but we can't complain about it. We take the fact we've been misled. We start reanalyzing. There's so many more places we're misled. And this is that disclaimer thing. You can't trust any of it. And so the only way I know to get away from, well, that's your opinion, you're not an expert, is to lay out the facts in the black and white. That's the only way I know to get around that. And so that we're confined to have to do that in a way that's fine because then there's no, no opinion that anybody can impose upon us. Again, the citizen being put on against another citizen in the face of the Fed, of the federal government, all-powerful federal government being questioned. Did you get miss that little point? They had the gall, the audacity to even question this sovereign power to the point that the victim of it had to say, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I have a remedy to stop this nonsense. Quit, quit continuing the beating. And that the government wasn't doing it on their own? That's fascinating to me. But anyway, while, while it is true the executive cannot selectively prosecute certain individuals, quote, based on impermissible considerations, close quote, page 18, quote, the equal protection remedy is to dismiss the prosecution, not to compel the executive to bring another prosecution. Page 18, and Judge Rayo is just getting warmed up here. She notes that the, quote, unwarranted judicial scrutiny of a prosecutor's motion to dismiss puts the court in an entirely different position, bracket, than selective prosecution case law assigns to the, closed, to the court, close bracket, page 18, quote, rather than allow the executive branch to dismiss a problematic prosecution, the judge, bracket, as Judge Wilkins and Judge Sullivan would have it, assumes the role of inquisitor, prolonging a prosecution deemed illegit illegitimate by the executive. Now, I find these statements. Now, you're not going to be able to use that statement against the executive. What you can do, you can use the role of exec inquisitor where someone in the executive doesn't follow the law at all. 
This is where the questions of that due process that we heard out of Ohio come up. You can use that statement, but you apply it to the failure of the black and white, the dereliction of the black and white code, the statute that you found. You don't pull down the statute. You actually enforce it because it's the only standard you have going on here. And now for Judge Rayo's KO, the judge Wilkin, uh, to Judge Wilkins and Judge Sullivan. Sullivan is the uh, district court judge whose decisions is is determined to be law until overthrown which should scare you. And this is where the interesting question point here is. Judges, quote, judges assume that that role in some, I'm sorry. She had mentioned the role of inquisitor prolonging a prosecution deemed Ill illegitimate by the executive. And now for Judge Rayo's KO to Judge Wilkins and Judge Sullivan, quote, judges assume the role in some countries Judges assume that role in some countries, but Article 3 gives no prosecutorial or inquisitional power to the federal judges. Now, my, I looked at Article 3. Is Judge Sullivan in an Article 3 court in the District of Columbia courts? I'm not so sure. So here's the first problem. Any of you that did that study under uh, Title 28, I think it is, for that in what 81 to 135 I don't think that court that they're in is is that article 3 court but she is, ascribes a cover of authority to article 3 and none nevertheless she says article 3 gives no prosecute prosecutorial or inquisitive power well my question then what about the legislative courts that are also considered district courts in every state not just the article 3 ones so to me I was like focused on this for a little while what is she actually saying here? But I think this is just one of those give me. This is another where she admitted that people are being misled. This is another subtle, this is a misleading of people in that they think Article 3 is actually working here. They use this as the open door when they need it. In other words, that judge felt that he didn't, he could be the inquisitional power. All he's got to do is phrase the the, pro, the power in a certain way, like I feared for my life and I get to murder you right on the spot. That's what you're seeing in here. Anyway, going on. This judge caught it all, at least to the extent that she did. But I think it, it, it's indicative of the, of the injustice of the system overall. And I think when you see how this works, you can take these principles and adjust them for you. Like I said, you want to just, you want to call someone inqui inquisitor, do it by the failure of the rem the result of not following a, stat a black and white statute then they have they consider when they're going to be put you in a criminal sense like we saw in the ohio case for the covid 19 orders they, they become this inquisitor they have the powers of the crime crime without executive oversight they weren't delegated all that they get to then put on you the penalties that they want to feel and they're already and you're already countered to them, so now they've they've already been insulted. There's no check and balance at all there, no due process. Going on, in other words, Judge Rayo is likening Judge Wilkins' arguments and Judge Sullivan's actions to what is done in non democratic third world countries. He says outstanding opinion, no mercy, end. Okay, I'll leave it there. You can read more. The point is I give and I give you the the, the link to this case. It's only about thirty eight pages. Uh, very interesting. I actually didn't read too much of what the dissent says. The first paragraph was enough for me to read. He starts in the wrong foot to begin with. He was he was he was he lamed himself before he shot himself in the foot in the other foot. So you need to read for that too. It's pretty quick, but it is interesting. I think you need to see it for those of you that that would be interested. Some of you won't. A lot of you won't be. In in a way, that's a shame. But that's again, it, it's what we have to know in order to help stop this because here's what's moving if we don't understand the dynamic within the courts and the injustice it's there not just as oh there's no justice how they've been able to make the injustice look justified is what i'm trying to get you all to see and not as just a point of contention and complaint as a point of avoiding that to you and how to more properly put a, a an, um assert a challenge against an improper and unwarranted f facility. Now, that's for you. Sometimes this stuff comes out, and you see the insanity, I told you the insanity kind of bubbles up around this because there's nobody anymore 
with a check and balance in their own self. Most everybody that's in a government at this point has been given the license to be vile. They don't even understand that. Where we hear coming right out of an Oregon county who issues a face mask order that exempts non-white people. If you didn't think it starts to get wild, folks, this is just the beginning. This is the tip of the proverbial. Is it, was it an iceberg in Proverbs? I don't think so. Anyway, you get my point there. This is the tip of the sphere. I'll go, I'll go that way. Lincoln County, Oregon, has exempted non-white people from a no, new order requiring the face coverings to be worn in public to prevent racial profiling. Now, I don't even want to read more because this got changed. Why? Because a bunch of people got riled up fast. I wish all these people would get riled up, not about the face mask, mask ruling more, which was racial, or racist, which was not equally applied if there was this real thing, but that it proves there's not a real thing, and instead of going after the mask, they should have went after the people who had no certified cause for an epidemic to be using the mask in the first place. So my view on this was, look how absurd your walking into the future is going to be this absurd and worse. What you see rioting in the streets is already sitting in the minds of the people in government. They just haven't figured out how to be be bold enough to offer it. So now you're seeing it just comes out, just like somebody vomits out this stuff. Doesn't think about it. They can be put in check, which we hear. Oregon County drops mask exemption for people of color after racist commentary. I want you to read this stuff. It's just the point of the, con of the context. They assert an alternative. We're going to give you a mask. And then your argument is, oh, but not against the black people. That's racist. So what you then agree to is that everyone, everyone now has to wear a mask there. When in fact, there's no cause to wear a mask at all. Why? Because they haven't certified to an infectious agent in that county. And so here's a, an example of how they get you to jump on the wrong thing, get you to buy into something that was not needed at all, but something that they want you to do. This is thesis. You're going to wear the, everyone's going to wear the mask. And we're going to enforce it as the people now. Instead of saying, wait a minute, where's the infectious agent? Where's the certification? Are they making that up as the people? Well, they could, underneath their power to alter and abolish, they could say it that way. They won't. More importantly, it's already written down that they're supposed to be doing that in every county. And so I just want to point out there's a dynamic going on. You can jump on the mask and how stupid it is. To, to talk about segregation, folks. Anti-reverse counter-segregation, whatever the heck it is. But the point is they're using it as a technique to get you to do something, and that's to support the wearing of a mask. Everybody has to wear a mask now. And they did it right there in the news. Right there. Perfect. And no one's done what I've asked is to challenge whether or not they can even have they have the authority to impose a thing, let alone a mask. And I'm not I'm not getting into the mask problems. In fact, I saw a picture on the Twitter. Some guy did a, a sneeze test, a cough test, a sing t test, and then they showed that if you put a mask on and you cough, a hundred it looked like a hundred percent of the bacteria coming out of the guy's face didn't go to the auger plate. And then more subtly, you looked at he sang through his mask and with the mask, and then sang without a mask into the auger plate. Then he talked, and then he sneezed. And if you look very very carefully. You start to see there's nothing in the cough. The big chunks get stopped by the mask. But we want to talk about like that 95% effective thing. If you look very carefully, there's bacterial vapor in the upper three where he's just talking or singing or even sneezing. And what's, what's interesting is the more he puts breath to it, the more aerosolized the pattern shows up inside. He's totally oblivious to what I see there is Apparently, the mask can aerosolize whatever the bacteria is that can get through. And I'm not sure if the bacteria is not larger than the virus, because we don't know. There is no test, right, folks? Anyway, getting back to this. It doesn't stop in Oregon. You see the stupidity coming out. No one wants to challenge the right thing, so they agree to another wrong thing, because it was started by a wronger thing. And we aren't a forward-thinking people. Well, listen, get behind the woodshed and learn how this works. I wish you all would. But here it kind of come worse. 
And this is really not different than we already saw happen in Washington that no one said anything about. But now the governor's working, they're working a little more constitutional, if you will, which makes it a lot more difficult. I've told you, as we move this thing along, it's going to be more and more difficult for people to find the narrow path on how, on how you stop something like this, if you can, and what it's going to take to do it. And you're going to have to know more about how the how your how this thing was established in order to do this. I only have a quick opinion on on some of this observation. It's going to take a whole again way beyond what one guy behind a woodshed can do. I mean, as an action, other than talk to y'all, get people to start promoting this this more proper action around and organize up to actually function through that more proper action and function. That's what's going to do this here. But here we go from the same state that offers segregation as an answer to get you to just wear the dang mask that you don't actually have not been proven that you need. Not that, they, like I told you, that masks are really that big of a, an evil. I use them if I get overwhelmed with allergies. But that's for me, not because I'm, I'm, some, corner, I'm some kind of a vector. And then for what, folks? There is no test. I mean, really, this people. I, I don't know why that little phrase, that tag, hasn't stormed all of social media. But it hasn't. And this is, again, a, to my mind, a failure. When I said, when, you finally, when people finally understand what that's saying, and the requirement is that there had to be one in order to find an infectious agent, and they have you all locked down on, on myth, and horror story, I'm stunned. I'm just stunned. And then they watch they wa watch them do it right in the news to you. We're going to segregate people wearing masks, and you're going to complain against us, and then we'll make everybody. You'll agree to, to put the mask on the other people, and so we'll get everybody to agree right now that everyone's going to wear a mask, and you're going to forget that you should have challenged us on whether or not we could actually certify to an infectious agent, which there is no test for. Let's get blow past all that. Oregon emergency bill would suspend due process amend amid COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm not going to go through the analysis of COVID. Well, I'll do a little bit. I won't rail too long. COVID means flu-like symptoms. Pandemic isn't th those two words together is impossibility. You can't have flu-like symptoms. Pandemic. You have to have an identification of an infectious novel agent that then goes across the international borders and can be found to be expanding from there. It has to have an original outbreak point. You have to have patient zero. You have to have all this stuff. It's all missing. But at any rate, COVID-19 pandemic, Oregon Governor Kate Brown convened, I should highlight, Democrat Portland. This state has been taken over for decades by the Democrats, and they have their most uh, population centers are the voting blocks that control because the other parties aren't that organized and or capitulate. None of those people get together to oust this one, this these tyrants in, in office now that are now pushing forth the sustainable dream, sustainable unity for the whole world. Democrat Portland convened Oregon legislature into emergency session on Wednesday, which is expected to last two or three days. The agenda has several bills, including HB 4212. That bill includes a clause written by Martha Walters, the Chief Justice of Oregon Supreme Court, at the request of Brown. This clause will allow Walters to suspend due process for up to 60 days if she deems it necessary during the response to the COVID pandemic. Let me stop right here. That's the Supreme Court justice that just entertained by her, after her recusal, had this, has the, I think it was her recusal, in the matter of the, of the Baker County that agreed without testing the state for its right to make a mandamus agreed that the state, the governor has all the power and you can't stop it. And called that case back to Baker, I assume, to now go within the context of what the goals are to get us back out, which is all constraint and control, and indefinite. And this is what we're walking into. This is a Supreme Court justice shows. Remember, Brown, I, I forgot to check if she's actually a part of the bar system. I think she is. I know she's got a J.D., She's involved with the Bar Association. 
She's involved with the uh, university system, which we sued in 2013. This is just the establishment, more foothold of the uh, sustainable unity crowd. It's green religion. We're we'll talking about the international religious freedom. Well, they've got it in this country, and no one's stopping them. And it's not proper. It's political. And it's worse than that. It's a weapon. But this is a Supreme Court justice that's supposed to be independent. You can't ask the Supreme Court justice for a thing. She'll tell you that she has jurisdi- doesn't have jurisdiction. But the governor asks, and she'll just her pal. She, she put her in the court. Put her. She put her in that spot. Essentially, will write a letter about the clause, giving that that dictator now the power to suspend due process. Well, it's not such a big deal. Washington did it. No one said anything. Now they're going to make this though statutory, and they can suspend due process. Now I'm not going to talk about the lunacy behind all this not just from the fact that you have something that isn't there's no infectious agent but from the fact of thinking you could you could take away a remedy suspend remedies for people and that that is supposedly doing a republican form representative government and then we have again our problem in 2013 we sued against and we identified congress as being the only party that, that, that has the power and they ought to and they're not and that's another that's an aiding and abetting we want to talk about making war on the laws of the United States, there's the elements building to be able to claim so. But anyway, going on this story, instead of the legislature reining Governor Brown in after her illegal orders under the CCP coronavirus pandemic, they have proposed to expand emergency powers of the state government. Okay, so I mean, I could read here. What I found interesting is even in here, I've been telling you a certain way to approach this, and I guess this is where I really want to focus on, on all this. I'm going to read the relevant passages in this article, because I want to expose something. What I've been telling you to do is written into the exceptions of this bill, even though it's going to expand due process. It has to do with, again, looking at their immunities. No different than what we did in Virginia, in a way, but now through this statute. Uh, This bill authorizes Chief Justice of the Supreme Court during emergency period and for 60 days thereafter, and upon finding of good cause, to extend or suspend time period of or time requirement in rule or statute in spe- specified court proceedings. Authorizes presiding judge of circuit court to extend custody and postpone trial upon finding of good cause and within specific limit, specified limits. They have to say this in order to make it look like there's rationale behind it and it's just. Anyway, they put it in here. They know to put it in here is all I want to point out. Authorizes Chief Justice to direct and permit electronic court appearances. They want e-government, folks. What have they been doing all this time without this law is what I want to point out as well. Again, they find what they need and then they finally make it so. And no one says anything about it. Then this thing goes on, extends the time to commence civil action or give notice of civil claim if expiration of time falls within the emergency period and within 90 days after the end of an emergency period. So if you have an emergency problem during emergency period, tough. The wrongdoer is going to get away with it. Im- immunizes, this law immunizes owner, officer, operator, employee, or agent of isolation shelter or public entity from civil liability that is predicated on a claim of illness, injury, or death from COVID-19, exempts from immunity conduct that constitutes gross negligence, malice, or fraud that is willful, intentional, or reckless, that is criminal, or that is unrelated to COVID-19. I'm going to stop there. You can read more about the, it keeps going on a little bit more. Let me go back to this. What have I been telling you? that this is, when I tell you to write a habeas that says that they don't have an infectious agent, that they're using the color of a label to wrongly acquire emergency power, and the statutes told how what the process was supposed to be if it was a lawful authority, Haven't I just now qualified the exemptions that are in this rule, even for as bad as it sounds, the suspending of due process, where you find what constitutes gross negligence? You'll have to find that for your state, but it's gross negligence is not simply following the law and willfully. 
malice or fraud? What did I say about the fraud of using COVID-19, a label without an infectious agent, and promoting that is fraud? That they willfully and intentionally and recklessly do. Why? Because the statute said if they wanted to avoid that, they'd follow the statutes. And what did I say? When they do that under color of authority, they're doing extortion or coercion or conversion in this state when both are there, which are criminal acts underneath that statute. And then that is unrelated to COVID-19. Is the use of the fraud, your complaint that they use this as a fraud under COVID-19 or as a treason against the people? You want to get to treason? Making wars on the laws of the state. Haven't I just been telling you how to... Even now, before they issued the law, what they were going to try and pass under emergency sanction, I have given you in the past, I'll just tell you, if you don't, haven't listened or heard it, I've given you the entire time the way to break that exemption for them. How could I do that ahead of time? How could you do that ahead of time? Is by knowing the battlefield. They have to throw some exemptions in. This is how the construct, the construct works. I've been telling you to prepare this way for months and months, and those of you that have would be able to go in and utilize the exemption in this statute to remove the officials that should be removed now under the habeas as well. We'll get back to the isolation shelter. You think FEMA camps or your home and all this other stuff maybe fit underneath that? That's a pretty ominous statement. They highlight that in this article. I don't want to get focused on that. I want to focus you on the fact that you can identify by the black and white Something that I've been talking to you for almost six months now that now comes up as an exemption that can be used to stop these people. There's no immunity from these crimes. There never has been. They had to write something in and they wrote those. And why? Heck, let's go look at the Constitution there. It's about the same. Go to Virginia. It's about the same. There's no immunity against these crimes. I've been trying to get you to look and see how... Not that you say it's a crime, you identify the elements that shows it's the crime. Objectively. Exempts immunity conduct that constitutes gross negligence, malice, fraud, that is willful, intentional, or reckless, that is criminal, or that is unrelated to COVID-19 is all I've been telling you to amass for yourself in your bag of law, whether you want to go take that anywhere, actually assert that and challenge your, your confinement under quarantine, whether you want to do a little bit more with it and show the organized criminal syndicate that's rolled up in this and that's making violation to everyone. That's all I've been talking to you is that exemption. I, I almost couldn't believe when I read it. I laughed. I said, great, make the law. I said, make the law. For as dastardly as suspending due process has to do, it sounds make this law, and we give ourselves the narrow path I've been telling you to follow all along. You now have it. They want to make it for you as law. Now, I'm not agreeing with the law. I'm not agreeing that it should be in place. I'm not agreeing with the way they're doing it. I'm not agreeing that the D Democratic Party is going to get something like this through, if not this thing. But as long as that exemption sits in there, you still have a path to defeat them. And you've heard me say this path for months and months and months. You heard me anticipate that when I told you Virginia's Constitution, if we couldn't tell it anywhere else, it was a nice simple place, I think what, section or Article 3, whichever one, states how that method's going to be, and then you go to their immunity. Perfect. Same thing. Same thing. What's our problem? See, what I'm telling you is going to go into the future if you just go ahead and agree to, to protect yourself. Don't let these criminals create the future they want. And moving on, I, I just get exasperated a bit. Emergency clauses in Oregon Constitution and laws, referendum power reserved to the people. What if you don't do what I said and you don't, and they, they've told you where the answer was all this time, they've agreed with me, where the exemption the exemptions uh, where the immunities don't exist relative to these acts and how to create them. We also have a different, as a people, we have a different action. In this state, they have referendum and initiative it's written into the Constitution. I'll give you a little bit here if you want to see the, how you kind of go about in your state looking to see what your actions might be against a law 
that's put into place that you don't like as a people. And I looked pretty quickly, the voting record, the voting people in the state is like 4% of the people that vote for governor can do an initiative or referendum. And so that that amounts to any, the Republican Party or two of the minor parties there could amass all their people and put this, a challenge to this bill, if you wanted to, on the on the ballot. The point is, I'm pointing out that People aren't helpless, but we're not organized, and we won't do the thing that we need to do. Even so, I'm going to say, you can look around. I found emergency clause in Oregon constitutes laws, referendum power reserved to the people. The problem is that emergency clause that they put in there that it kick, kicks in immediately, it removes this referendum, which creates a whole other problem. Of, does the emergency clause in that state eliminate the constitutional remedy of referendum? Well, my view was, well, it doesn't speak to initiative the people's initiative to do something. And so we just, being that it's silent, the people have that if they needed an excuse. The people there could amass, even if it's the Republican Party, they got plenty of people. If their if their votership, their voter voters would get up and want to stop this, if they saw that it was a violation. Again, the people have to decide that. I've just explained to you that I still see a way through even if it gets imposed. And remember... That's only applicable to the courts. That's clearly, you can, anybody who thought this goes to the government is kind of missing the point. That's why the, they got the write-off from the buy-in from the Supreme Court, which shows you it's how tied in the Bar Association is, and the, the judiciary is not independent. All right, so don't go into that state thinking that's there, and that's one of the things you write for, how to destroy that. Okay, so, but the things I've been telling you, if they made that law, I was laughing, let's go, let's put the law. I don't care about that. I would focus my attention there. But as a people, because I want to show people that we're, we, we, it's just on us. We're not helpless, and yet we want to whine that we are, and we can't do anything. But if this is found to be bad in that state, there's quite a few things that you could point out, but there's an initiative process. And it has some certain rules. The black and white tells you how to follow it. And there's quite a bit of rules. Okay, so you, you could pull together some people. You could actually pull this off. And if you'd wanted to get rid of those laws, this law and any any other types of laws, you could have been doing that. And I was, it's a lot of people, like 75,000 people to get the initiative forward. But that was actually small potatoes compared to all the, let's say, Republican Party that would be against them doing this, against uh, extending your harm relative to equity principles ex uh, or your due process where, Again, you see the government will beat down on you and beat down on you like Flynn, and then you you have to you have to say, well, wait a minute. In that case, the prosecutor didn't want to prosecute, which never happens at the state level. They got 92% conviction rate. They're not going to do do that, but that's beside the point. But where you got a, a system that requires that the abused one tries to protect the abuser by getting a fourth party from allowing that and a private citizen from beating down on the citizen go to another member of that government to say, can you tell that sovereign that he has okay right to stop beating me? Is something just completely outlandish that we have agreed to. It's happening in this state. You can, it will take all the people, you know, they say the people made this, so it's going to take all the people to stop it. And there's a there's the initiative process. I gave you a link you can read that. Uh, but I want to change, move on now as we move this quickly through, try to show you some other things. All of these consequences that we're suffering right in front of our eyes, that we're all in quarantine but no one's home, the lights are on but no one's home, relative to your assertion and challenge of rights for you, and then us as a society, it gets moved along and presented and proved by we find so-called best science sciences, these people are relying on these things instead of the statutes that said they had to certify. They just say it's best science. Well, it's a little interesting thing that came out. For those of you that are writing, you can use this. You can show that uh, in anticipation that if they're trying to get rid of that willfulness, that gross negligence thing, you can show that it's known that the uh, trials and studies are not that influence these decisions are not more powerful than the statutes they should have followed. They do not act as proper guidance where we find selective publication of antidepressant trials in its influ influence and on apparent efficacy. Evidence-based medicine is valuable to the extent that the evidence base is complete and unbiased. 
selective publication of clinical trials and the outcomes within those trials can lead to unrealistic estimates of drug effectiveness and alter the apparent risk-benefit ratio. Methods. We obtain review of the Food and Drug Administration for for 12 studies of 12 antidepressant agents involving 12,564 patients. We conducted a systematic literature search to identify matching publications. For trials that were reported in literature, we compared the published, published outcomes with the FDA outcomes. We also compared the effect size derived from the published reports with the effect size derived from the entire data set. Result, among 74 FDA-registered studies, 31% accounting for 3,449 study participants were not published. Whether and how studies were published were associated with study outcome. A total of 37 view, studies viewed by the FDA as having positive results were published. One study viewed as positive was not published. Studies view, viewed by the FDA as having negative and questionable results were, with three exceptions, either not published, 22 studies, or published in a way that, in our opinion, conveyed a positive outcome, 11 studies. According to the published literature, it appeared that 94% of the trials conducted were positive. By contrast, the FDA analysis showed that 51% were positive. Separate meta-analysis of the FDA and journal data sets showed that the increase in effect size ranged from 11 to 69% for individual drugs and 32% overall. Conclusion. We cannot determine whether the bias observed resulted from a failure to submit manuscripts on the part of the authors and the sponsors for the decisions by the journal editors and reviewers not to publish or, or both. Selective reporting of clinical trial results may have adverse consequences for researchers, study participants, healthcare professionals, and patients, and period, and governmental politicians, the politics, the lawyers, the governor, the public health authorities, and anybody else that's throwing you an expert that says that they relied on studies. They're garbage in and garbage out. This is what they're relying on. This is what you can defeat. And then you say, and they knew they shouldn't rely on these studies. This just confirms the fact had they followed the statute, which was thus and such, they wouldn't have harmed anybody, at least unwarrantedly. And so here's a, a study about antidepressants. You don't think that list of observations would be applicable to any subject matter over any comment that's supported by best science or studies or studies of studies? Here's your line to show, and here's a a reference that shows that the record is biased. And that record relied upon was not the law, and it reliance upon it was caused harm. And had the statute been followed, the, the, the official would have eliminated that as a possibility and was required to eliminate that as a possibility. Now you have two violations. So, Take, again, these studies. It has nothing to do with the COVID. I can put that best science study versus study and look at all the numbers that everyone wants to use and show you you don't know nothing, folks, nothing. And the government doesn't know anything, and their reliance on that is fraudulent, and they knew it. Why? Because the stat, the black and white, I keep telling you to go back to, that says they should have traveled a different path. They failed to travel. Now we've got a dereliction of duty, and we have the willful wrong. Those standards in that exemption I was reading, which is supposed to be in a law coming up. Now, it's supposed to take away your due process. You think it takes away due process when you allege the things I've been telling you in that time? I don't think so. We interrupt the normally recorded live broadcast for a tech diff, which abruptly ended the broadcast and recording early. With deep apologies for any trouble this caused, I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose. Well, that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass.